Stratovolcanoes are Earth's most majestic and deadly volcanic giants. Steep-sided mountains forged by fire and fury, rising where tectonic plates collide. Built from layers of viscous lava, ash and shattered rock, these towering peaks conceal immense pressure beneath their slopes, erupting not with gentle lava flows, but with cataclysmic violence. They are the architects of devastation. Mount St. Helens, which tore its own side apart in 1980, Mount Pinatubo, whose 1991 eruption dimmed the global climate, Krakatoa, whose 1883 explosion was heard across oceans, and Mount Tambora, which plunged the earth into a volcanic winter when it erupted in 1815. Born along subduction zones, these volcanoes ring the Pacific in the aptly named Ring of Fire. Each one a reminder that beneath the calm of mountain majesty lies a ticking geological time bomb. Beautiful, breathtaking, and utterly unforgiving. The final stratovolcanoes in Australia existed over 200 million years ago in an era when the continent's eastern edge roared with volcanic fury. Back in the late Paleozoic and early Mesozoic, what is now eastern Australia was a restless tectonic frontier. A place where an oceanic plate dove beneath the edge of Gondwana, the supercontinent that included Australia. In this subduction zone, magma rose and towering stratovolcanoes grew, fed by the collisions and fiery upheavals beneath. This is the story of Australia's last stratovolcanoes. Don't forget to click on that subscribe button, hit the bell icon and like this video, as it's the best way to support this channel. And if you enjoy it, consider sharing it around. To understand when Australia last had stratovolcanoes, we must first look into the New England origin. Geologists identified a New England origin, or NEO, in eastern Australia, as a collage of rock terrains that were assembled along the Pacific margin of Gondwana. Crucially, the NEO contains late Devonian to Triassic subduction-related rocks, evidence that a volcanic arc existed here from about 370 to 230 million years ago. In simple terms, Eastern Australia once resembled today's Pacific Ring of Fire. An oceanic plate was sinking or subducting beneath the continental edge, generating earthquakes and lines of volcanoes along the plate boundary. West Dipping subduction persisted for a remarkably long time, from the Devonian into the Triassic, making the New England origin the youngest subduction-driven orogeny in Australian geology. During this time, multiple volcanic arcs blossomed, island arcs and crustal fragments were added or accreted onto Gondwana's edge as the origin developed. By the Carboniferous and Permian periods, roughly 320 to 250 million years ago, a continuous continental margin arc was established. Lava and ash erupted from volcanoes along what is now eastern New South Wales and Queensland. Geologists infer that the New England volcanic arc was Andean in scale and style, analogous to the grand stratovolcanoes of the modern Andes. In fact, late Carboniferous volcanic deposits in the region bear a close resemblance to those on the flanks of Chilean Andes volcanoes. This suggests that towering stratovolcanoes and large caldera complexes once stood over eastern Australia. These volcanoes would have periodically unleashed explosive eruptions, sending pyroclastic flows, which are hot avalanches of ash and gas, sweeping across the landscape and blanketing the region in tuff and lava. Envisioned a scene 300 million years ago, a chain of stratovolcanoes dominates the horizon of Gondwana's east coast. Each volcano is a steep-sided cone, built from layer upon layer of viscous lava, ash and pumice, the classic structure of a stratovolcano. These peaks likely pierce the clouds, fed by magma that evolved to be silica-rich and sticky, and a site to rhyolite in composition. Such viscous magma produces steep 30-degree slopes, because it doesn't flow far from the vents. Stratovolcanoes tend to be majestic but volatile features, and the New England Arc would have been no exception. Imagine snow-capped summits, yes, evidence of glacial gravels exist in some arc deposits, and glaciers clinging to volcanic peaks, just as in today's Andes, a hint that these mountains rose to significant heights even in Permian times. Surrounding the stratovolcanoes were other volcanic features. Caldera supervolcanoes and volcanic shields coexisted with the stratovolcanoes. Enormous ignimbrite sheets, welded tufts from pyroclastic flows, found in New England, suggest that cataclysmic caldera eruptions occurred, blanketing vast areas in volcanic ash. For example, 
geologists have mapped thick late Carboniferous ignimbrites in a Tamworth belt, which likely erupted from large caldera complexes. Meanwhile, conglomerate rocks containing andesitic lava boulders hint that classic stratovolcano lava flows also erupted, but these tended to remain closer to the volcanic vents, not reaching the distal flanks where ignimbrites spread. In essence, the ancient New England Arc hosted a full drama of arc volcanism, from effusive lava flows to explosive ash eruptions, shaping a rugged volcanic landscape on Australia's east. These Paleozoic volcanoes left behind a treasure trove of minerals and rocks. The eroded remnants we find today include volcanic rocks ranging from basalt to rhyolite, with andesite and dacite being common, the typical output of stratovolcanoes. There are pillar basalts and marine tufts from early island arcs, and thick sequences of volcanic breaches, lavas and ignimbrites from the continental arc phase. As the arc evolved, calcalkaline magma, rich in water and volatile content, fueled explosive volcanism and also intruded beneath the volcanoes to form great granite bodies. Indeed, a New England origin is intruded by the New England batholith, a chain of granitic plutons that solidified at depth during the Permian-Triassic arc activity. Many of these granites are I-type, igneous granites associated with arc environments. They are frozen magma chambers that once fed the stratovolcanoes above. Nature's alchemy during and after the volcanism endowed the New England origin with rich mineral deposits. Hot hydrothermal fluids circulated through the volcanic rocks and intrusions, depositing metals that would one day be mined by humans. The region is best known for gold, antimony and tin deposits, formed in the waning stages of the origin's magmatism. For instance, gold antimony veins formed around latest Permian-Triassic granitic intrusions, while tin or cassiterite accumulated in granitic Gricin systems and alluvial placers. New England's tin fields were among Australia's earliest mineral exploits, while copper, lead, zinc, tungsten, molybdenum, bismuth and other metals also occur in the origin, reflecting the metallogenic fertility of this long-lived volcanic arc. In essence, the final stratovolcanoes of Australia not only built mountains, but also sowed the seeds of mineral wealth as their magmas cooled and released ore-bearing fluids. But nothing in geology is forever, and by the late Triassic, around 230 to 220 million years ago, the stratovolcanoes of the New England origin were reaching their final act. The continental collision and compressional event, known as the hunter bowen orogeny, marked this endgame. From about 265 to 235 million years ago, Eastern Australia experienced a great crunch. The crust buckled and mountain building orogeny peaked. This came with widespread volcanism and plutonism. Zircon dating shows a flurry of arc magmatism between 255 and 215 million years ago during the Hunter Bowen orogeny. This was essentially the last gasp of the subduction arc. Some of the youngest arc rocks in the origin are around 220 to 215 million years old, indicating active volcanoes persisted into the late Triassic. But by that time, plate tectonic configurations were shifting. The eastward rollback of the subducting slab likely caused the volcanic arc to migrate oceanward, and the collision or accretion of the Gympie terrain, an outboard Permian island arc, may have choked off the subduction zone by the Triassic's end. The result? Subduction halted at the Australian mainland. With no plate diving beneath it, Australia's fiery arc went dark. No new stratovolcanoes would ever rise on Australia's soil after the Triassic. The existing volcanoes, no longer replenished with magma, gradually died and were left to the mercy of erosion. Over the ensuing tens of millions of years, wind, rain and rivers gnawed away at the mighty cones. Stratovolcanoes, built of relatively soft volcanic rocks, erode rapidly once activity ceases. Their peaks crumbled and landslides tore at their flanks. By the Jurassic period, the once majestic volcanoes had become ruined stumps. In the Cretaceous, as Australia began to rift away from Antarctica, any remaining high-relief volcanic edifices were further worn down or buried under younger sediments. Today, no dramatic cones remain to mark the site of those Paleozoic stratovolcanoes. Only the subtle clues in the rocks, volcanic fragments in sandstones, belts of granite, and the metalliferous veins tell their story. The final stratovolcanoes in Australia thus disappeared into deep time, victims of both tectonic change and erosion. After the Triassic, Australia's east coast transitioned from an active plate margin 
to a quiescent passive margin. The next chapter in its volcanic history would be very different, arising not from subduction at all, but from hotspots and rifting within a plate. To a time traveller standing in Cretaceous or early Cenozoic Australia, the absence of volcanoes would be notable. It was a land in volcanic silence for over 100 million years. But eventually, new fires ignited under the continent, in a pattern unlike the old arcs. It would be over 180 million years after the last stratovolcano before Australia witnessed significant volcanism again. When volcanism did resume, it was due to intraplate hotspot activity and crustal extension, not subduction. This new style of volcanism created very different volcanoes. Hotspot and plume volcanoes rose between the Cretaceous to Cenozoic. These occurred within the tectonic plate, above upwellings of hot mantle, hotspots, or where the crust was stretching. The magma is typically basaltic, low in silica and very fluid. Eruptions are less explosively violent, but can still be dramatic, producing broad lava flows that can travel far. This forms shield volcanoes with gentle slopes, or volcanic plains. Rather than one continuous arc, this activity formed sporadic volcanic provinces and chains as Australia's plate moved over hotspot sources. Examples include the chain of big shield volcanoes along eastern Australia in the late Cenozoic like Tweed Volcano slash Mount Warning, the Glasshouse Mountains, and the widespread Newer Volcanics province in southeastern Australia. One stark contrast is in volcano morphology. The old stratovolcanoes would have resembled the classic cone of Mount Fuji or Mount St. Helens prior to 1980, tall, pointy and layered. The newer volcanoes were mostly shields or small cones, broad profiles or low hills. For instance, shield volcanoes like the Tweed Volcano, Mount Warning, are massive in volume but not steep. They spread lava in all directions, creating a wide footprint. In terms of rock types, arc volcanoes yielded a spectrum from basalt to rhyolite. Hotspot volcanoes in Australia are overwhelmingly basaltic, with minor exotic variants like potassium-rich basalts with leucite in some eastern fields. Arc volcanism often produced stratified deposits and caldera collapses. Hotspot volcanism here produced lava fields, scoria cones, mars and lava tube caves in the flows. Perhaps the best modern illustration of the difference lies in comparing the newer volcanics province, NVP, to what an arc field might have looked like. The NVP, active from 5 million years ago to today, is a volcanic field covering 15,000 kilometers squared in southeastern Australia, peppered with nearly 400 small volcanoes. These NVP volcanoes are monogenic. Each erupted only once or a few times, producing basalt cones and mars, none of which grew into giant mountains. Their lava flows lie flat across the landscape, forming a basaltic plain. In contrast, a subduction arc tends to produce polygenic stratovolcanoes that erupt repeatedly and can build great height. If one were to stand in Victoria 30,000 years ago during an NVP eruption, you'd see fire fountains and lava streams. A spectacle to be sure, but on a much smaller scale than the apocalyptic eruptions of a stratovolcano. There would be no towering cone, just a new scoria cone, maybe a few hundred meters high, and a field of fresh basalt cooling into a black plain. The geological summary of NVP notes that while there are numerous scoria cones and tough rings dotting the plains, the volumes of lava are vast but spread thin. This is almost the inverse of an arc volcano, where large volumes of magma are concentrated into one big edifice, and occasionally giant ash flows. To summarize the contrast in dramatic fashion, the stratovolcanoes of the New England origin were like a chain of blast furnaces forging mountains out of andesite, whereas the hotspot volcanoes are like many simmering cauldrons spilling basalt across the countryside. Both are born of Earth's internal heat, but their expressions on the surface differ profoundly. Australia's stratovolcano era ended long ago, but its legacy is engraved in stone and in the continent's landscape evolution. The New England origin's rugged hills, dotted with old mine shafts and traversed by prospectors of the past, owe their existence to those final stratovolcanoes and their fiery gifts of granite and ore. Every speck of alluvial gold in a New England stream and every tin nugget in the old diggings harks back to the magmatic plumbing of an ancient volcano. The cessation of subduction spared Australia the kind of ongoing volcanic violence seen in, say, Indonesia or the Andes. In exchange, it granted a long stability, allowing soils to form, life to flourish, and humans to inhabit a land free of volcano-related danger 
at least until small eruptions like Mount Gambia came, and even those were modest. In a poetic sense, one can imagine that the ghosts of those stratovolcanoes still loom over the Australian landscape, not in form, but in influence. They are there in the fertile rolling highlands of New England, where volcanic ash turned to rich soil eons ago. They are present in the dramatic gorges of northern New South Wales, where ancient ignimbrites now stand as cliff lines. They even echo in the place names. The New England region's very name evokes an old world, but to geologists, it's an ancient world of volcanoes reborn. I hope you found this as interesting as I did, and as always, thanks for watching. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.